Hey guys, welcome back to the show. We are talking to Dr. Titus Chu on everything regarding neurogenesis, which is basically regrowing your brain. It's a great interview. Uh, we learned so much out of it and some really surprising ways of dealing with anxiety, depression, which we had we personally hadn't heard of. Um, you may have heard of BDNF and it's all the rage right now. Well, you're going to learn all about that as well. So it's such a great interview. Strap yourself in, get some notes. You're going to learn a lot. Dr. Titus Chu, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're so excited to hear about all about regrowing our brains. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So this is obviously a, like, you know, it's exploding right now. People are so into this, searching for BDNF. How do I regrow my brain? Like there's all this new science has come out in it. Can you just take us to the basic steps? Is it possible to regrow parts of our brain? And if so, what is actually going on inside the brain to make that happen? Awesome. Yeah, that's a great question. It's really an exciting discovery. It's it's interesting, though, because we've actually known about this for many years, like the ability of the brain to regenerate itself. The cool thing is now there's a lot of practical applications out there that people can use to improve their brain function, to think better, to feel better, but also a lot of these discoveries we can use for the treatment of different types of brain health challenges like concussion as an example. So the the whole process of growing new brain cells is the fancy term is what we call neurogenesis. And I love this because neuro stands for brain and genesis stands for new beginning. <laughs> How rad is that, right? <laughs> that we have the ability no matter what we've been through in our lives if we've experienced trauma or in my case concussion or if we've been struggling with certain types of health challenges like anxiety or depression our entire lives, how amazing is that, that we can not only strengthen connections that already exist and change how we see ourselves and the world around us, but we can actually grow new brain cells. For many years, scientists, physicians, doctors, they thought that once whatever brain you're kind of born with after a certain small period of like childhood, that's pretty much what you get, right? Haven't you guys heard that? Mm -hmm. Like that's that's what I learned before I dove and became a, a brain geek <laughs> and dove <laughs> deep into the world of neurology. Like I thought that was the case too. It's like the brain I was given was what I have. But thank God that wasn't the case because I suffered a concussion, actually several concussions many years ago, 20 years ago I was in a terrible car accident. Thank God for neurogenesis and neuroplasticity because those were – like the discoveries that gave me hope to heal my brain and also work with thousands of patients over the years. So, you know, Matt, you asked me like, what are, what's happening in the brain when we can do that? One of the key compounds, it's, the, it's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF for short. The way I like to explain it, it's like miracle grow for your brain. So, okay, we know without a doubt that neurogenesis is possible, that we can grow new brain cells, even up until the eighth decade, like research has shown. But I know it goes beyond that, right? Not only do we know it's possible, we know of ways of accelerating that process. And one of the key compounds in that equation, one of the secrets of neuroplasticity, so to speak, is BDNF. And so BDNF is this brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's, a, it's like a growth hormone but that's related to a lot of brain function. So let me step back for a second. So we're talking about neurogenesis, which is already a miracle, right? <laughs> like starting over or starting new, right? Like neuro and then starting afresh. I just love that. But in addition to that, not only can we grow new brain cells, we can also be intentional in how we strengthen the connections that we already have within our brains. It's that's the, the phenomenon there is known as neuroplasticity. And so just to create the distinction, we can grow new brain cells like neurogenesis, and we can also strengthen existing connections in what we call neuroplasticity. Why is that important? Well, like I said, like, well, let me step back another step. I firmly believe that our experience of ourselves and of others and of the world around us is fundamentally a function of the brain. Now there's a lot of other stuff going on, right? But I know personally when I had a concussion how that 
my brain health, which I took for granted before, it was like a wake up call. It's like, oh my goodness, not only is like having a functioning brain important to not experience symptoms, but once I was able to turn that around and heal my own brain, then using the same ideas in neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, you can begin sculpting a life of your dreams, right? And so neuroplasticity, that's, it's that whole idea that based on your experiences, and I always love, uh, I'm a visual and kind of kinesthetic learner, so I brought my brain. Oh, I, yes. I took it out. I painted it for you guys. <laughs> the bag after this call. I was like, wow, this is some really advanced neurology <laughs> yeah. stuff that we're into now. You can take your brain out. That's awesome. Exactly, yeah. That, that's, uh, that'll be our, our second video we do. <laughs> Try it at home yet, kids. That one would go viral. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So the, the interesting thing about neuroplasticity in the brain itself, like I said, I firmly believe that our ability to connect with others, to connect with yourself, and to experience a life, like all the wonderful things in life, like compassion and empathy and, you know, accomplishing your dreams, it's all function our brain. And specifically, these connections within our nervous system we call neural networks, right? And so I kind of like to... Um, the analogy I like to use is our brains kind of like imagine like a tree like we have some plants back there So when your when your roots are strong That's the analogy of those connections are strong And so the stronger your roots are the stronger your trunk and your branches the better you can show off all your leaves right? And the leaves could be art or philosophy or connecting with others right like creativity and all the wonderful things in life Right, so that's what I call the physical brain, and so it's it's a function of all these connections between our brain cells. Right now, it allows us our experience of all those wonderful things when it's working, but when it's not, it could be the root cause for so many brain health challenges. Right, and so the idea behind neuroplasticity is through our experiences we can change the structure of our brain. Isn't that wild? Like the Very fact that literally sit there and imagine things and you're literally changing the physical structure of your brain <laughs> that just blows my mind i've been doing this for years and it still blows my mind thinking about that right and so neuroplasticity is not only like the basis of my life's work it's literally the the way the the science behind how we learn to do anything right from simple things such as walking and talking, which many of us have accomplished, to the more elevated things like hosting, you know, these vlogs and stuff and writing books and painting art. But it also lays the foundation for a lot of my life's work and, excuse me, helping people recover from things like concussion. Awesome. Wow. What an opening to our chat today. And how exciting is that message? You can change your brain. Uh, I, I would like to ask, uh, Dr. Titus, you mentioned before you have your own story of uh, challenges with your brain. I think you said after concussion. So mm -hmm. what is your story and how did how did you get to where you are now? Yeah. So I kind of alluded to that in that opening, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> Yeah, over 20 years ago, I was in a terrible car accident and that almost took my life. It was really bad. Like, I got hit by a car. I was actually on a scooter, got hit by a car, flew through the air. I broke my ribs, dislocated my shoulder. And thank God I was wearing a helmet at the time because if not, honestly, I wouldn't be here today. You know, I, I remember, I specifically recall, it's like one of, you know, like, in the most intense experiences of our lives, we always remember them. Either they're the best or the worst. That's part of neuroplasticity as well, but <laughs> that's another conversation. But I specifically remember when I kind of came to and like caught my breath, my helmet was off. Like the impact was so strong. Like I had the actual helmet like tied on tight, right? It was snapped on. When I kind of came to, my helmet had flown off. So I think the impact when I hit the ground like it was strong enough to throw the helmet off, even though it was tightly fastened. So it was, excuse me, it was pretty intense. Right? It, was, it was a very intense experience. And so I survived, but I ended up with chronic pain. And I searched within conventional medicine to try to find answers to fix my chronic pain, to heal from my concussion, and I didn't find any. So I went outside the box 
and I decided to go back to school and I got a postdoc in clinical neurology. I, and then I learned, I wanted to learn like ways of optimizing my healing and also bringing that back to my patients. So I got a master's in nutrition. That's where a lot of the BDNF conversation can, you know, we can explore that. And I just searched outside of the box and everything I learned that I would then bring back to my patients, I would try out on myself first. And through that whole process, not only was I able to heal from my concussion, but like I said before, the same principles of neurogenesis and neuroplasticity also apply for me to then take my life to a whole nother level, right? Now, if you had told me that at the time when I was struggling with vertigo and depression and didn't want to get out of bed, I wouldn't have I'd been like, whatever, just get me out of pain, right? But it's the same exact principles that we can change our brains. We can grow new brain cells. And like I said, when we understand the, the science behind it, we can get so specific and intentional with how that actually looks. Is someone out there struggling with a concussion or struggling with anxiety or depression, we can use the same principles as if someone wants to take their life to a whole nother level of like what I was describing, like visualization and life goals. It's the same process. So yeah, that's kind of where I ended up. And along that way, not only did I work with you know thousands of patients over the years, I discovered a deep passion for teaching. So a big part of what I do too is just educating you know, empowering people with this information. Number one, the fact that it is possible to grow new brain cells. And number two, healing is possible no matter what you've been through. And finally, number three, using the same principles, you can really craft a life of your own design. It's pretty amazing stuff. Awesome. So cool. So excited. I'd love to hear more about this. If someone was to walk into your practice and be like, I can't get out of bed. I'm so depressed. Um, yeah. Or like, you know, I've got terrible anxiety. Um, you know, it's taking over my life. Where would you start? And they've heard about the elixir of BDNF or they've heard around these things. And they, you know, I guess they're in your situation where they've, they just want to just get through the basics of the day. Um, yeah, what would you exactly. take them through and how would you train them and teach them in this um, practically? Yeah. So a big part of what I do is, I've developed a process that I call root cause neurology. It's really getting to the underlying root cause for why is this person dealing with anxiety? Why is the person not healing from their their concussion or like in a way that they think they are? So first step is getting to the underlying root cause. And sometimes people don't even walk in. Like I work with patients and private clients virtually because I can get a lot of information, honestly, in just the conversation. So step one is there's an assessment process, either questionnaires, online intake forms. And from there, when I review that, I already have an idea of, okay, again, so if someone's dealing with anxiety or someone has vertigo or brain fog, in my mind, and this is just the way my, my brain works now, when I hear those things, they're like clues that helps me kind of identify, okay, where in their brain and nervous system is the root cause. So as an example, you know, everyone's unique, but a very common root cause I see for anxiety is there's an area of our nervous system we call the brainstem sitting at the top of the brainstem. The top part is what we call the midbrain. Let me actually blow this apart. Not only did I take my brain out for you guys, I'm going to blow it apart for you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Thank what, you for your great yeah. sacrifice. Are you selling BDNF <laughs> at the end of this? Because I don't know how you're going to put your brain back together. Yeah, I have a BDNF <laughs> direct line right now. To get through this. I'm going to pass that after this conversation. So here is my brain stem. So here's the brain stem. At the top of it is what we call the midbrain. You guys, have you heard of the reticular activating system? It's this whole, it's kind of like our alarm system. When people talk about like visualizing, you know, and manifesting, that's one of the neurological substrates that allows us to do that. Because when we start to bring our attention, we can actually shift this reticular activating system to bring, like to make things that are relevant to us, important to us, like they just start to show up, right? There is a science behind that. Anyways. Part of this reticular activating system, this midbrain, this is an area, it's kind of like the alarm system for our nervous, right, for our brains. So if something's off in our environment, like, you know, if there's a threat or some type of danger, this tells us this triggers the fight or flight response, right? So within here, 
there are neuronal pools like brain cells that send signals to your autonomic nervous system. So if you sense a threat, whether real or perceived, your brain, like in specific, your brain sense triggers the stress response. As you guys know, there's specific things that happen. Gut motility goes south, meaning it slows down. You stop releasing digestive enzymes. Your pupils dilate so you can see more light. And all the blood flow moves from like your reproductive organs and your gut to your muscles so you can either what? Fight, freeze, or <laughs> get out of there. So that's specific. And going back to what I'm saying, uh, in terms of anxiety, one of the root causes that I've seen, a very common underrecognized root cause for anxiety, is actually overactivity of their brainstem. So going back to your question, Matt, I'll do an assessment process. I'll ask some very simple questions. Do you startle very easily? Do you find that you have sensitivity to pain? Or maybe lights and sounds throw you off? Well, if that's the case, then your brainstem might be very well one of the root causes for your symptoms. And we can fill in the blank X, Y, Z for your anxiety or for your headaches or your chronic stress or pain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So step one, we have to get to the underlying root cause. And that could be done through assessments like quizzes or questionnaires and then a conversation that many times I can have a conversation just like we're having right now. And I'll have a pretty good idea because I've been doing it long enough and I've tried to heal my brain <laughs> over the course of many years, hopefully successfully. So I know the ins and outs and just having a simple, quick conversation, I can have a really good idea of what the root cause is. Then from there, if necessary, if they actually come to my office and I do have some patients who fly in, I'll perform an advanced neurological exam because guess what? Everything I just, just described to you as an example about the brainstem, I talked about specific physical, what we call exam findings, right? I said the pupils dilate, blood pressure will increase, right? They'll have decreased blood flow to their extremities. Guess what? I can measure all that. So not only can I un identify and figure out, okay, what's the root cause, right? Just through a conversation, then there's specific exam findings, like physical realities that are clues as to further what's going on with a person's nervous system. And then from there, right? So that's the assessment phase. Once I've identified the root cause, then I go, I start putting together an entire plan to rebuild their brain, to regrow brain cells. And it could be centered around doing things like brain training exercises. So, you know, a lot of people talk about brain health, they talk about food and supplements, right? Now that's important. Remember what I talked about earlier about like the, the analogy of the tree with the roots and the trunk and the branches? That's what we call our physical brain. And the physical brain is like I said, it's all the structure, right? It's the communication pathways, right? But in addition, just as important for our brain health is what, we, what I call our chemical brain. And so the analogy of the tree, it's the soil that my trees exist in, right? The roots. And so the real world example of that is then things like blood sugar imbalances, digestive disorder, right? Inflammation. A lot of what a lot of your previous guests have already talked about is like looking at the emo, like the neurochemical milieu that our brains exact, actually exist in, right? So I'll look at things related to brain training for the physical brain, right? There's things we can do to activate you know, to calm down the brainstem by activating the vagus nerve, which we can talk about in a bit. In addition, if I identify, I can run lab tests to see is one of the obstacles to a person's healing, is it because they have gut inflammation, right? Do they have leaky gut? Do they have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? And then we can also explore like single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? <laughs> like all these different genetic, you know, variations that can prevent healing as well. So that's, Part of my process, step one, is getting to the root cause by exploring what's happening in the physical brain, as well as the chemical brain by running lab tests if necessary, right? And then finally, when I work with patients, I also explore the emotional brain, because all three pillars, physical, chemical, and emotional, need to be working and strong for us to have all the amazing things that I described earlier that are a function of a healthy brain, right? So there's ways of, you know, 
using our minds. This is the wildest thing. Like I said earlier, right? We can sit here and close our eyes and visualize things. And if we do it enough, we're literally changing the structure of our brain, right? So using like different types of journaling exercises or mantras or affirmations, like when done right, you can shift and nurture the emotional brain. So that's like the whole process, just to give you the answer to your question. It's like, it's really holistic. I, you know, first step is getting to the root cause. Step two, once I've identified that, I put together a plan to address the physical brain through brain training, maybe the chemistry. We might look at diet and supplements personalized for their unique genetics. And then finally, some types of exercise where we start bringing the the actual person's mind to then help heal the brain. Isn't that wild? <laughs> you can use your own, once you're able to, you know, once you're able to get your mind on track, right? There's a lot of what we call negativity bias that kind of makes it difficult. But what I said for what I just laid out for you, like addressing the physical and chemical brain, I typically start there first, right? Because I find that a lot of people who struggle with, you know, yeah, neg- what we call ne- overactivity of their negativity bias or have like mental health challenges, I usually find that there's some type of physical reasons perpetuating that. And when we heal and strengthen the physical brain, right, and then when we clear out and, and redo the soil for the chemical brain, a lot of the emotional stuff, stuff starts to like unravel. And if it doesn't, at least it gives that person more bandwidth to then be able to face those issues, right? Does that make sense? To be able to actually reap the benefits of visualization. That was actual experience for me as well. It's like, you guys probably heard about, oh, just manifest your you know, your realities. Well, if that was, if it was that easy, why are we living in like a, a paradise, right? So I think a lot of these things, these obstacles, and that's kind of how I work through with my patients is what I went through. I had to stabilize the physical foundation. I had to clear out my chemistry. I had to get rid of gut inflammation and gut infections and on and on, right? But then from there, I had more bandwidth to then engage my mind for the higher, the, the, the higher functions of our brain, right? Of compassion, empathy for not only for others, but first and foremost for self. And then when we, once we get there, then we can extend that to others. Great. Thank you for sharing. That's so exciting. And I think it's actually quite wild that uh, when we're in discussions about anxiety and depression, that actual brain health is so, so little discussed. Don't you think that's wild? We always talk about maybe all these um, um, soft therapies and um, emotional strategies and not necessarily the actual health of our brains. I would like to ask you a little bit more about the reticular activator. Uh, You said that it uh, is common within uh, your clientele that have anxiety that they uh, have an overreactive reticular activator. So what do you do for those patients? How do you get them to settle down that part of their mind? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and I want to, before I answer that, I want to speak to that great point you brought up in terms of, you know, when people struggle with mental health challenges, which I did for a really long time after my concussion, it's like a lot of times what's like the prescription, you go to a therapist or you, you know, you like work out your problems that way. Now, don't get me wrong, I think that's a really important part of the like piece of the puzzle and part of my healing was getting therapy honestly. But a big part of it like I said before, I had to stabilize the physical brain. I had to clear out the chemistry, right? I had to optimize that stuff. And so that's the thing, that's one thing. And I think in one of the the reasons why it hit home for me so much was because a lot of these mental health challenges that I was struggling with, like excessive worry and paranoia and like anger issues, they didn't exist at least to that level prior to my concussion, right? So it was like a wake up call for me, like not only in terms of my healing, but this understanding how a lot of quote unquote mental health challenges could actually be at least in part contributed by what's happening in our physical brain as well as the chemistry of it. And so like utilizing a holistic approach, I feel is totally necessary, whether that's working with a practitioner that does a lot of it, 
or working with like a multidisciplinary team. So thanks for bringing up that point because it's really important because I see a lot of people struggling unnecessarily because maybe they're just trying therapy and talk therapy and this and that, which is part of the equation. But if they have a gut infection, that makes it hard for them to process that, right? So that's a great point. And in answer to your question about the reticular activating system, so one of the things that, like, that's part of it, it's the reticular activating system. It's an entire neural network. Remember I talked about how there's communication pathways? So this communication pathway, it's very specific for, like, alertness, as well as, like I was telling you, it's kind of like the alarm system. You guys have heard that, that saying, like, pinch me to make sure I'm not dreaming? That's part of the reticular activating system. One of the things that like turns it on is pain. So that's why it's like if you get pinched, it activates the reticular activating system and then it wakes you up. So I found a lot of people who I work with either because of a head injury or maybe sometimes emotional trauma or even just chronic stress. Remember how I was talking about neuroplasticity? It's like we can use this idea and experiences to heal our brain. But there's a dark side to neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, really, at the end of the day, it's about efficiency. Does that make sense? So if you're constantly under chronic stress or if you've experienced pain for years, whether it's from like a headache or like back pain or whatever, not only do your tissues like the actual back or your neck muscles or whatever change, research has shown that areas of the brain that process pain, guess what? They become really efficient. Right. So my point is when the reticular activating system after years of chronic stress or pain or something sudden like a concussion or car accident, when it gets stuck in the on position, then things in a person's environment that normally aren't considered a threat become one. You guys follow me? Remember how I said it's like it acts as an alarm system for threats, whether real or perceived. And so that's the crux of it, right? So the great news is, though, again, when we get intentional, when we can identify the root cause, if, if a person's anxiety is due to their brainstem being overactive, like the top part, there's other things we can do intentionally to create neuroplasticity and grow new brain cells there. So one simple thing we can do, and I alluded to this before, so we can activate the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is this is one of 12 cranial nerves. Well, if you want to get technical, there's 13. But anyways, mm -hmm. the vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10, and it it's housed in the bottom part of our brainstem. So it's really fascinating, right? So you have the top part of your brainstem, which is like the alarm, this middle part, the pons, and then finally the bottom part is what we call the medulla. The medulla is what puts the brakes on the activating system, right? So and thank God for that because that's the thing. The brainstem is a really old structure, right? Like not only do humans have it, like reptiles have it. You probably heard of like the reptilian brain. What they're referring to is the brainstem, right? One of the areas is that. And so because it's such an old structure, this will almost always overpower the higher centers of our brain, right? And so, for example, this higher center of our brain we call the prefrontal cortex, it allows us all those wonderful things I described earlier, compassion, empathy, to be able to visualize like an ideal future. So I find one of the reasons why we get in our own ways is because this older part of our nervous system that's about survival, when the two come up in battle, who do you think is going to win, right? Like this guy, because it's about survival. So... One of the ways, like I said, that we can calm down and reset the alarm, like turn off that alarm that's just like going off 24 seven is by utilizing the lower part of the brainstem. And that's why a lot of patients I work with, especially who have had concussions, they might try things like meditation, but it doesn't work for them, right? And it's really very difficult for them. Or they might experience things like anxiety and they try to meditate and they feel more anxious. Why? Because I find a lot of the cases, again, is because the foundational structures of the nervous system, this part, the brainstem, 
need to be balanced out first. You guys following me? So once those areas are balanced out, then you start reaping the benefits of all these higher functions of our brains. Like, like I said, that was my experience as well. I tried meditation early on when, after my concussion. I tried visualizing like better health. Did it work? No, <laughs> because I didn't have the bandwidth at the time. I had to start with the foundation. And so one of the ways we can do that, like I said, is by taking advantage of another old structure that we call the medulla, which houses the vagus nerve. So you might be wondering, what are some ways that we can activate the vagus nerve? There's actually a lot of different ways. And the way, whenever I work with patients or clients or I educate people, I look at it like there's three main ways. There's low tech, right? So things you can literally do on your own at home. There's high tech, where you can engage like brain technologies to activate the vagus nerve powerfully. And then finally, there's the more advanced ways of activating the vagus nerve. That deals with because, remember how I said there's the, the vagus and the brainstem are part of a huge neural network? We can actually use other areas of the nervous system to target and activate the vagus nerve as well. That's like as a more advanced topic and, you know, treatment strategies that I do for my patients and uh, private clients. But those are the three main ways. Number one, low tech. Number two, high tech. And finally, number three, the more advanced ways. So some low tech ways that you guys might have heard about already, like gargling. You probably heard like, oh, you can just gargle. How is that possible? It was like, when I remember when I started teaching my patients this or I share with them, they're like, how, how is that a brain training exercise? <laughs> I'm just gargling. But one of the reasons for that is because your palate, in order for you to, when you gargle, you're exercising your soft palate muscles. Guess who's in charge of that? One of the cranial nerves is the vagus nerve. So, but the interesting thing is, actually go, I'll talk about this in greater detail. Um, the vagus has a dirty little secret, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> so one low tech way is gargling. Another great way that I personally love that I found a lot of my patients really benefit from, and a lot of people out there, a lot of my online community, is what I call palming. So palming is such an amazing way of activating your vagus nerve, and I find it so effective, especially these days. Why? Because so many of us are on like devices more so than just before the you know the beginning of the whole global health crisis. I think already we were on devices a lot, but now we're by the nature of our you know our jobs or obligations or whatever, we're on devices a lot more. So the second way is what I call palming. And I'd love to walk you guys through. You want to join me? Sure. Yeah. So palming, what it is, it's a great way of relieving eye strain. Like if you find yourself on the computer a lot or on devices. And one of the ways it works is it actually activates your vagus nerve as well. So what you want to do, have you guys seen the Karate Kid before? Yes. You don't have to do this, but I like to do it for dramatic effect. And I believe in chi and energy, but, but that's besides the point. So you can do the Miyagi thing, right? <laughs> and just get your hands a little bit warm. You feel a little bit of warmth there? Mm-hmm. Okay, and then what you're going to do you're going to gently close your eyes and you're going to take the fleshy part of your palm and then put it right over your eyelids, just like this. If you're watching at home, you've got to follow along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like... Oh, this is fun, especially if you guys are, like I said, you're on social media a lot or on devices. And our audio only peeps, um, we've just got our, the, the large part of our palms over our eyelids. Exactly. <laughs> And so, yeah, with your eyes eyes closed, gently closed, put the palms, the fleshy part of your palms on your eyelids. Gently, imagine like an egg yolk. It's like that amount of pressure so it doesn't burst because we definitely don't want to burst these <laughs> eggs. So gently put your eyes there, or your palms there, and just bring your awareness to the sensations around you or rather lack thereof. Because when you do this, when you apply pressure to your eyeballs, there's an actual neurological connection that connects with your vagus nerve, and this triggers a calming response, what we call a parasympathetic response. 
And some of you out there, if you do experience eye strain or light and sound sensitivity or things like that, you might find that some areas of your eyeballs, because you actually have a bunch of muscles on your eyes that control your eye movements, you might find some areas are a little bit sore. Without putting too much pressure, you can kind of gently push into those areas. And one way to deepen the activation of your parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve, is you add another vagus nerve exercise. You do some deep breathing. So I invite you guys to join me. Take deep breath in. And out. And whenever you're ready, you can gently take your palms off your eyes. But I encourage you to keep your eyes closed still, so that way it's not a shock to your cranial nerve, to your optic nerve, which processes lights. And then when you're ready, just gently open your eyes. Ah. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> uh, what was your guys' experience? Like every time I do that, it's just like a reset. Mm, exactly my exact thought. Definitely. It's so easy just to reset. To be honest, I was struggling a little bit because I did a gym workout oh, <laughs> early this week and my shoulders are like, ah, oh, I can't lift my arms. Oh, but yeah. but <laughs> if my shoulders went on Struggle Street, I would have found that really relaxing. <laughs> And I had a slight distraction when you talked about chi and palming and I was imagining like iron fist on my arm, like my, my, my fist was going to start glowing and I was going to start be able to punch things and be a superhero. But (laughs) But that was lovely. What a great, what a great technique. Yeah, I find that whenever I do that, like when you, when you can drop into that space, like other ways to kind of amplify the experiences when you do that, bring you, bringing your awareness to how dark it is because it's a way of kind of again we are exposed to so much stimulation these days like from our devices from our phones to the tv computer all that stuff so not only is that a great way of activating your vagus nerve the scientific term is actually called the oculocardiac reflex like you can look it up it's an actual thing because it connects with your eyeballs to your vagus nerve but not only is it a great way to shift your brain from a stress response to a relaxation and healing response it also takes a lot of strain off like visual strain so that's um, uh, palming is a great way of doing that yeah, yeah. No, i was i was just curious to hear about um because I, i've seen some studies and people that live in cities um that are constantly stimulated you know like they're constantly seeing advertisements lights honking cars loud yeah. noises loud noises that that part of their brain is overstimulated um, exactly. versus those that work like, you know, live or work in the country. And they're literally larger. Right? Are larger, right? Is that true? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's, it's what I call synaptic saturation where, because that's the thing, just like, you know, imagine like physical exercise. Anytime you challenge your body physically, what do you need to do? You need to rest, right? Especially if you hit it hard, if you go to the gym, lift weights, or you're doing hardcore like cardio or aerobic training, how are you going to recover from that? You got to rest, right? And so the same thing goes for the brain. Like we're not built, we're not meant for 24-7 stimulation, whether visually, whether lights, right? So this is all relatively new for us. And what it does, it really challenges our nervous systems to a huge degree. And I find that some of these like, practices that I've developed and some of these things, palming actually I didn't develop, I'm not gonna take credit for that, it's actually a ancient yogi practice, Tibetan yogis developed it. But these exercises, like I find, like especially when I work with clients or just people who are constantly stressed, sometimes it's best to not do things, right? And so there's actually exercises that I call inactions. Like, so for example, palming, because what it does is it helps to reset your nervous system. So you guys probably heard of like uh, in Alzheimer's, there's these plaques, we call them tau, like there's all different types of plaques that build up. Well, guess what? Those build up in healthy brains too, right? So the thing is, if they're not cleared out, one way of doing that is like having a good night's sleep. But other ways of doing that is like avoiding synaptic saturation. So if you don't reset your nervous system, you constantly throughout the day 
literally build up toxic plaques in your brain. And so I live, I mean, I used to live in Chicago, then I moved to Berkeley, which wasn't as busy, but in Chicago, it's like nonstop, right? And so I found that those, um, those more quiet practices, like, you know, gentle types of yoga, palming exercises, uh, va- activating the vagus nerves, those are huge, right? Not even if you're just trying to like heal from some type of brain health challenge, but even just maintaining sanity in a modern world, right? And again, especially if you find yourself on the computer a lot, that palming exercise has been a game changer for me. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, I've obviously so many questions I have in my mind, but um, I was think I've read a book called Spark recently. Um, it had a. Uh, have you heard of Spark? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's such a game changing yeah. book for me personally someone that struggled a bit with ADD, anxiety, and I've obviously had, you know, used different drugs at times to, um, you know, beta blockers and things like that, you know, yeah. from Valium or whatever to, you know, just to try and get my brain into some yeah, form of normal state. Pump. Exactly. But when I read that book, you know, you can do this naturally for free through exercise. And I'd love for you to just yeah. take us through this because it was a bit of a game changer for me. And I'd love to hear it from your perspective as to why, what, ex- what can exercise do to with BDNF um, and, you know, and growing your brain, growing your brain well, and yeah. beta blockers. Grow new brain cells. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, That's yeah. a great question. And yeah, I love that book, right? That book is, it is, it's revolutionary because it, a lot of times when we talk about, you know, when you talk about things like ADD or ADHD, like the current approach outside of medications is what I call a top-down approach, right? If a child isn't able to sit down and focus, what do we make them do? sit down and focus, but guess what? That's not how we're designed, right? So a lot of what I do is a bottom-up approach. And what does that mean? So I look at different areas of the foundational structures of the nervous system. So this one back here, so just to give you guys kind of orientation, here's the front of my brain, (laughs) here's the back of my brain, and this little guy back here is called the cerebellum. Guess what the cerebellum's in charge of? Balance coordination, like the timing of your movements. So when we're born, we're not born with this amazing ability to focus, right? We're not born with this like amazing ability to create art and philosophize and, you know, practice spirituality. No, we're born to like move and engage with our environments. So that's a big part of my life's work and a lot of the whole, the spark, like what they talk about there, these physical movements One of the reasons why they work is through BDNF. Exercise activates and helps your brain produce more BDNF, like miracle grow. But in addition to that, remember I was talking about the physical structures of the brain? When you exercise, when you are when you were a kid and tumbling around in the playground or spinning on a merry-go-round or sitting on a swing, you were activating specific neural networks that were the foundation of your brain. Specific of this area we call the cerebellum, and then another area we call the vestibular system. Why is that important? Because there are powerful bridges between your cerebellum and your prefrontal cortex, the higher centers. So when you actually go and like exercise and move your body and balance and coordinate your movements, you're not only strengthening your cerebellum so you can have a strong core, Core, like core muscle and core stability, you're actually also strengthening by way of that connection, your prefrontal cortex. What does that allow you to do? Better focus, concentration, quote unquote behavior. Like one of the biggest things, like studies, like that was, you know, really changed my perception of things. It's like when they looked at kids who had behavioral problems or children who had cognitive struggles, guess what one of the biggest interventions they did that improve that more recess time right it wasn't like oh you're having issues with behavior you just have to sit down and reflect on your bad behavior how is that going to work for kids right i mean i'm 43 and i still have trouble doing that (laughs) but they find that kids who go out and play and engage with their environment and like sniff dirt and like get dirty and all that stuff tumble like they play that literally act, there's a specific scientific reason for that, that activates their frontal lobe, their basal ganglia, and their cerebellum. Again, not only helps them move and coordinate better through space and through the world, like movements, 
but also it helps their brain coordinates their thoughts better. Isn't that amazing, right? So, so I know, cool. yeah, that, like that was one of my favorite books. And he kind of explores a lot of the BDNF, the chemistry of it, but there's also the physical structures. And the amazing thing too is, I, I know you guys are going to love this. If you love that like idea, not only can you use exercise to grow new brain cells, you can use different types of exercise to target different regions of your brain. As an example, you guys heard of ping pong, right? You guys call it ping pong or table tennis? Yeah, yep. ping pong is a physical exercise. I love, I grew up playing that like, oh my God, I love it, right? <laughs> but one of the things they've actually done studies, ping pong grows brain cells in your prefrontal cortex and your cerebellum, right? And then so there's like specific exercises that you can do to target different regions of your brain. Again, why is that important? Because you can then personalize a program. So if someone had a particular health goal, right? Let's say, for example, anxiety. If someone was struggling with anxiety, there's areas of the nervous system that I found to be a root cause, like I spoke, spoke about before. One of the areas we talked about, right, was the brainstem, right? Well, guess what? There's breathing exercises that you can do for the brainstem to help with that. But in addition, one of the most underrecognized causes of anxiety that I found in my practice that not many people know about, even doctors, is an imbalance in what we call the vestibular system. Okay, so let me speak to that really briefly. The vestibular system is part of another neural network related it starts in our inner ear then it goes deep within our nervous system to this area we call the insular cortex the reason why that's important i found in my practice i've worked with a lot of people who have had anxiety over the years and they've tried changing their diet right they've tried changing supplements they've healed their gut they're taking gaba supplements and still they're dealing with anxiety why because all those things that i just described right diet changes, supplements, those all focus on the chemical brain. Maybe they've even tried you know, therapy and that's helped. In those situations, I typically find it's the physical brain that we need to focus on. You guys follow me? And one of the structures that I've seen almost time and time again, everyone's different, right? You have to really personalize it to get the good results. But one of the things I've seen a lot is the an imbalance in the vestibular system, right? And so the cool thing is there's specific exercises that you can do. Again, this whole idea of you can use specific exercises to train your brain for whatever goals you have, right? So if you struggle with anxiety, you can do specific vestibular exercises. So what's something like that? It could be something as simple as sitting on a rocking chair and moving back and forth. Isn't that crazy? Because wow. very deep within your inner ear, you have all these little sensory organs that perceive movement. So when I'm going like this, and you guys don't have to join me for this one. Right? <laughs> I might, I might you my might head find in yourself microphone. feeling a little comfortable <laughs> and relaxed. There's actually, there's a neurological pathway between the vestibular. This is another cranial nerve, the vestibular system, and guess who? Your vagus nerve, right? So you guys might have, you might have heard about that, like children with autism, one thing that's very common that we see is this rocking movement. Why are they doing that? They're self-soothing, right? They don't know about the vestibular system and the vagus nerve connection, but they know when they do that, they feel better. And for a lot of kids who have autism, not everyone, right, has to be personalized. It's like vestibular types of exercises have been shown to really be helpful. But again, you gotta personalize it. So yeah, something as simple as doing these movements I know, for example, I have a lot of patients who, you know, I work with, I, one patient I have in mind who had a concussion, they never had anxiety until after their concussion, right? And I performed a neurological exam and I found, sure enough, they had an imbalance in their vestibular system. But I already had an idea before I even did the exam, how? Because she told me one of the only things that helped her anxiety, and it wasn't breathing exercises or supplements, it was cycling, right? Like when I get on a bike and I cycle, like my anxiety will go down, right? Why, how is that possible? 
Well, again, it's the inner ear, the vestibular system. The vestibular system helps us perceive movements. There's movements like back and forth that I was showing you. That activates a very specific part of the vestibular system. But guess what? In addition, our vestibular system perceives movements like this, what we call translational, like backwards and forwards movements. So when she told me that, like, yeah, I know a lot of people who might not get this. They'd be like, why, why is that like important? That was the key to cracking her case, right? Because I understood the neurology underneath that. She's like, yeah, when I ride a bike, I feel so much better. So guess what? Some of the exercises I had her do outside of cycling was sitting in like one of those rolly chairs, like at home, sitting in the chair at home and moving herself forwards and backwards. Because when we did that, we specifically targeted her vestibular system, right? So again, there's all these physical exercises that we can do to retrain the brain depending on what a person's health challenge is or what their health goals are. Isn't that wild? <laughs> so <laughs> interesting. Just, yeah. Very cool. I'm curious, um, uh, just as we wrap up as well, I just wanted to touch on this with supplements because people are Googling it, trying to work out, I want BDNF. Is it in a magic herb or like, you know, so, so is there any supplements or things that people can take that can help aid in neural genesis or yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So there's definitely research showing how you can use supplements or nutrients to activate BDNF. So some of the most common ones you guys have probably heard about already, like DHA, docosahexaenoic acid. It's one of the omega-3 fats that's found in high amounts in like fish oils or some algae for you vegans out there. And in addition, things like curcumin, the polyphenol found in turmeric, the root, that gives curry that brilliant orange, beautiful color. That's another way to activate BDNF. In addition, medium chain triglycerides found in things like coconut oil has been shown in the research. And so those are some nutrients and ways of activating BDNF. But then there's also lifestyle things like we talked about earlier, just like exercise, right? You don't even have to get technical with like figuring out which type of exercise for your brain. Simply doing like cardio training or high intensity interval training has been shown to powerfully boost BDNF. Or if that's not your cup of tea, like strength training, right? And not only does strength training help increase BDNF and growth hormones, Research has also shown that it increases our density of mitochondria, right? Which are the battery packs of our brain cells. So yeah, it's, it's so cool, right? It's literally things you can do for free at home to optimize your brain health. Now we can, but the awesome thing is because of the technologies available and the, the understanding of the science, we can pretty much break it down to the science and make it really personalized for what a person's you know, health goals are. Really so cool. if we, we see a, like a, a commercial come on, you know, on TV saying BDNF, just take this pharmaceutical. You're like, ah, we've already worked it out. It's already in nature. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a thing, you know, that's, I, I love like one of my, and this is totally, I'm the total nerd. Like I'll read there's, in, we have what's known as PubMed. It's like these scientific articles. Yeah. So it's like, I'll read through these articles looking at research with all those technical terms, but then like pull from that and be like, wow, you can use these things that, you know, science is like kind of uh, reducing down to all these individual parts. But just like you said, a lot of it is found in nature. And I find some of the most effective ways of approaching it is like using the low tech ways, right? As part of like a lifestyle, right? As part of your everyday self care rituals, but then adding like upgraded or higher tech options so you can accelerate that process right and kind of stacking it that's kind of how i like to do it. it's like I'll, i do things like meditation i practice yoga i do a lot of these kind of low tech ways of activating the vagus nerve but in addition there's these technologies i use to really get like to supercharge that right it's this whole field that i'm totally geeking out over it's called electroceuticals <laughs> you guys have heard of uh, nutraceuticals before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like you take the components like you're describing, Matt. Like you take certain pharmaceuticals or certain compounds found in nature, then you high dose it. That's the nutraceutical, right? But you can do the same thing for the all the different things I was describing in terms of triggering neuroplasticity. Like you can gargle and that might help. 
But some people who might have tried gargling and they're like, I still feel really stressed or I've tried breathing exercise and it's not helping my anxiety. There's other technologies that we can utilize that target the vagus nerve to turn up the volume for those areas and trigger neuroplasticity faster. So I'm going to make a prediction. I think like pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals are going to continue to evolve and grow, right, when it comes to brain health and solving the world's brain health challenges. But I think one area that is going to explode in the next decade is this whole field of electromedicine or electroceuticals. Because one of the coolest things is it's it's non-invasive, right? Like you can literally wear devices that target your vestibular nerve to help with anxiety, right? You can do things to activate your vagus nerve to help with insomnia or chronic pain, right? And it's it's really like I see the sky's the limit for that stuff. And again, the more people understand this and, you know, it's then translated from research, but then given to people who need it. And that's why I love what you guys are doing, just taking kind of like the practical things and sharing it with the world that's where it's at right but i'm yeah i'm really thrilled for the future of that for sure awesome well thank you so much for everything you've shared today it's definitely justified my treadmill that i put underneath my desk <laughs> yeah, and, um, which i thought was just all like placebo that i could focus more but wow. now i understand i could sort you, you can, can put your brain it. back in your head right now because thank you for bringing in show me see your brain and <laughs> i know exactly why that's yeah. um i can focus Actually, much better try doing this try walking on your treadmill and juggling, maybe not at the same time. <laughs> wow. No, really. Juggling is actually a really great way to get your prefrontal cortex. But I would start, if you never juggle, try one ball, then two. And then if you can do that while you're on the treadmill, dude, you are going to be like... Supercharged. Wow. Your brain up to the next level. Well, I guess like as I'm working, on my, it's like touch typing... Yeah, maybe yeah. I'm halfway there. You you said that you've struggled to take notes. Maybe if you get yeah, really good true. at writing, that, that'll be that another That would be level. my only bad review of uh, walking while working is that your handwriting is not quite as good, but typing <laughs> it's and... Not, <laughs> yeah, it's not that pretty. Um, what's the best way of getting in contact with you? Someone said, um, you know, maybe, you know, they've loved, heard what you've said. They would love to get in contact with you. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best way of doing that? Sure. Yeah, I have, go to my website, brainsave.com. And you can reach out to me and get in touch with me through that avenue. And yeah, brainsafe.com. I also have an Instagram as well as Facebook group, Dr. Titus Chu. That's D-R-T-I-T-U-S-C-H-I-U. Awesome. We'll put that all in the show notes. But thank you so much for just shining such an entertaining light on this whole new field, which I think has such a capacity to change people's lives. I know Absolutely. it's helped change my life. Yeah. Um, it's, that's why we want to get this message out there. But thank you for everything you're doing. And um, yeah, let's, I can't wait to see these new electrodes that you come up with and we'll see you on CNN <laughs> or, or on the news in a few years time. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It's been fun. Take care. Oh my goodness. What a great chat. There was so much in there that I hope you guys enjoyed and were able to glean from. I, we, I, Matt and I could have asked a million different questions and we only were able to scratch the surface. So if you are interested in learning more, particularly about these high tech solutions for vagal, vagal tone or mental health, we've included an extra resource below that Dr. Titus and his team put together for us for all the things we didn't quite get to. So make sure you download that, check it out because uh, there's so much more to learn that I think could be really helpful for you or a loved one. So, but back to our usual spiel, a lot of you aren't subscribed. So please, <laughs> you're in trouble if you don't know. But if you uh, hit the subscribe button below and the notification bell, and even if you like today's chat, hit the like button as well. It really helps us get seen by more people, uh, uh, which will help get this sort of information out to people that need to hear it the most. 